Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a, webinar webin a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We will hear from GOBX Uranium Management, including Dan Major, the CEO. And during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook, and then we will take some questions. You can type your questions into the chat box above at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, First, we need to discuss the fine print. During this GoVX webinar, forward-looking statements may be made, and I would direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the company's presentation. It can be found on the website govx.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek out their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on GoVX Uranium. Now, before Daniel steps up, I would like to say a couple words. First, a plug for our upcoming October Fest conference over three days next week. That's October 18th, 19th, and 20th. We will have presentations from 85 different companies, and that will include 17 different uranium companies, including GoVX, and a keynote address from Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Attendees can register at red, redcloudfs.com. <clears throat> so uranium prices, they have been on a tear into 2021 and more specifically since August. Now, while the $30 to $32 range has been normal for most of the year, the UX broker average price peaked at $51.12 on September 17th. Now, we do believe that movement over the month there uh, was due to both uranium price trading volumes and from speculation. The activity spurred a run on the uranium equities, and as usual with periods of stark volatility in the commodity price, we did see investment risk reward play out in the markets. Producers were up sharply, I'd say 40% month over month, but explorers and developers were up more, you know, I'd say between 50 and 60% on average as a group. The Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, they issued $245 million in equity through early to mid-September and therefore purchased about 6.5 million pounds of, of uranium during that time, and that drove prices up to 40 bucks. Then Sprott decided to increase its shelf prospectus from 300 million to 1.3 billion US, and this led additional equity raising and buying in the market, but we do believe this is playing out and 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 caution that, you know, maybe too much too soon. You know, we'd love to see a more sustainable rise in the spot market. We don't, so we don't get these rapid pullbacks like we're seeing right now in the uranium price. You know, we saw the price pull back to 37.25 as of yesterday. But over the two, last two weeks, the, you know, the stocks have pulled back. I'd say they say they're still up about five to 10% average for the month, uh, over the last month or so. Now we do expect Sprott to provide a re-rating here in the uranium market. We do believe, however, that long-term contracting is, is one of the most important drivers. The world does use 177 million pounds of uranium annually, and as spot prices and term prices both rise and converge, we believe the long-term contracting will increase. So bottom line, we still like the fundamentals for driving uranium prices higher. With disinvestment in the uranium sector, there has been a lack of exploration and a lack of discoveries, and new mines will be needed in the coming few years to replace mine closures, let alone cover the growth in uh, uranium demand. So with that uh, segue, I now turn it over to Daniel to update the, the audience on GoVX Uranium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Look, looking forward to this. I'm just looking for my slides. There we go. So, yeah, I will take you through uh, GoVX and our projects in Africa. Uh, I will touch on the market as well, just to add to color to what David has already gone through. Uh, as he mentioned, there is our forward looking statement. So, GoVX, we are a Africa focused, development focused company. Uh, our target is to become a uranium producer. We have two fully permitted projects, the Matawela project in Niger and the Matanga project in Zambia. We work very strongly towards simplifying our projects, looking at straightforward uh, process design and mining. 
we're targeting very much how we're going to finance these projects and how we're going to structure the offtake. Despite these being permitted projects, we have considerable exploration on upside on top of what is already large mineral resources. And for Philea, our third project, we have a very interesting exploration story there, uh, looking at uranium, copper, gold, and silver. And then in this year, we've also started to structure our company very much towards the development side. So as I said at the beginning, we are an Africa-focused one. Um, we are in mining jurisdictions. Niger has produced uranium since the early 1970 with Arriva and Iran, then Irano um, producing up to 140,000, more like 150,000 tons now. Um, the mining code has not changed in Niger since 2006. We've had multiple changes in government, democratically so. We're in Zambia, uh, a country known for its copper mining. Uh, again, recently went through democratic elections, uh, has a new president, very focused on getting its GDP driven, getting its mining industry going. And then Falea, um, a new entrant into mining, but is already the far, fourth largest gold producing country in Africa. So Africa, very much a place to operate. I recently had the benefit of going to Arano Somaya mine. Um, going through the town of Arlet, which is a, a somewhat scruffy town, very surprised to go into Somaya, where you're seeing something which basically looks like a first world mining operation with the standards you would expect anywhere in Canada and the US. So I think the key thing I would really uh, reiterate here is that the fundamentals to the market for the uranium have not changed. They are still very positive. And in fact, the WNA in its most recent numbers actually increased its demand forecast for nuclear energy from 2% by 2040 to 2.6%. Increasingly, we've seen governments focus on greenhouse gas emissions and their reductions thereof. You've seen strong target increases out of China. But I think more exciting, again, in Japan, which already had a target of 20 with its new president, has come in with a very pro-nuclear stance going forward. And Russia has increased its position from 20% to 25% as a forecast of nuclear energy. But on top of that, we have to remember nuclear energy is competing against other power markets. And I think on top of what you've seen of the uranium price move, the gas price move and oil price move are even bigger drivers and has certainly sent a shockwave across the world with the UK, the UK particularly initially just looking at small modular reactors as their way forward on nuclear, completely changing that and going back to the primary large reactors and are now committing to two large reactors with the government taking a stake in one of those. You've seen similar comments coming out of France, very much committing to their long-term position in nuclear. And again, any decline being pushed out much further as they realize that energy security is becoming a primary part of any government's model, not just cutting carbon emissions. On the supply side, um, last year, uh, we had about 180 million pounds consumed, about 120 million pounds mined. The rest came out of the secondary market of about that 30 million of that 60 million came out of drawdown of inventories, uh, predominantly North American um, utilities bringing down inventory. Uh, while they saw very low prices out there, they really had no reason. They had low energy prices, had to cut costs. And the way to do that was consume their inventory. Um, but what you're seeing is a continued positioning of that, that by 2030, effectively, that secondary inventory supply has gone um, and needs to be replaced. Uh, you're looking at a scenario by 2030 where Cameco Cigar Lake closes. Uh, as well. So you are looking at about a 58 million pound deficit at that point. And that includes bringing back most of the restarts that are out there. So we're still looking at a deficit and new, new supply to go forward. A lot of people talk about the uncovered market. And I think what we have seen as a result of Sprott's action and the volatility in price is the US utilities are now definitely starting to look at where their long term material is coming from. 
There have been a number of RFPs coming out to the market, including coming to Goviex, and they're looking at from 2024 out to 2033, not just out of the North American market, but out of the European market as well. Also, higher gas prices are helping utilities commit to longer term prices. The other one, I think, which is an interesting benchmark was a utility out of Southeast Asia who came back um, with an RFP. Uh, what was interesting is that for the first three years, they put a price ceiling on at $56. Thereafter, they had a price ceiling at $78. So giving you a sense of where they think the market is going to go. So as I said, the fundamentals are very much there for the market. Sprott is obviously being helped pull in inventories. Expect them to continue to do that. It, it's like having a utility that just actually never uses its material. But the, the, the market has got a lot more interesting as the energy markets are maturing as well. So where does that leave GoVX? We are very much a developer. We're looking at bringing our Madawela project on, uh, hopefully in 2025, if all goes well. We're keeping Matanga about two years behind that. And then the Falea project is much more an exploration play at this moment. So Madawela, um, situated up in northern Niger, uh, near the towns of Arlet and Akokan. We are in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and I was out there recently, and just on the southern part of our property, uh, where the Mirian deposit, uh, you can still have grass there after the rains. When you get to the northern part of the property, it is like the picture with the camel. There is absolutely nothing. It is a desert. But we benefit from having those two mines there. So we've got power uh, coming from the Sonachar coal mine down in the south, which has got about 26 megawatts of power coming off it. There is more than enough capacity with the closure of Comanac for GoVX. Um, there is enough water in the area as well. Uh, we hit water 40 meters below the surface. But in the case of the power, we are looking under the final, feas final feasibility study at a solar hybrid scenario as well um, to consider using both the grid power. Uh, the solar power, diesel and battery, uh, despite the fact that it is sunny um, all day long, every day, you still need to cover the night shift uh, when there isn't the availability. And on the case of water, uh, we continue to see how we can reduce our water consumption, things like dry stack tailings, trying to use dry milling. You know, there is a lot of water, but we also have to recognize the social implications of us using water in an environment where a lot of the nomadic people have no access to water. In April um, of this year, we put out an updated PFS. It was very much restructured uh, to look at the debt market and how the debt market would see the project. In the first five years, we reduced the overall capital drawdown by some $70 million. We brought our operating cost down to $22 a pound for the life of mine, but down to $18 a pound in the first five years. We reduced the rate of the project to make sure that it, the open pit would more than cover the debt period. And certainly from a debt coverage ratio of two times, we look like we can cover about 50% of the capital of the project at the moment from the debt market. And we've done a lot of work in the debt market previously. An export credit facil back facility is very doable. Uh, African development banks are very interested in this part of the world. And having the government of Niger as a partner is a, a strong position to be in. But as a company, we've also not just been moving forward on the technical uh, and continuing to look how we can improve the project, we started to work on the other parts. So at the beginning of this year, we appointed Chris Lewis, uh, ex of BHP, selling uranium from Olympic Dam, then for Cameco, and then for Uranium One. Well over 30 years in the market selling uranium. And already I've spoken to well over um, two dozen utilities, pretty well every single one in North America, uh, Canada and the US, and in Europe as well. So we're well ensconced there uh, and working with them to explain where we're going to go and what we will need to finance this project. More recently, we brought on Endeavor Finance, uh, whose speciality is the unconventional jurisdictions. They don't do North America. Uh, they tend to do places like South America and West Africa. But they bring a very strong technical background with them as well, which is why we brought them on this early to help us make sure that the bankable feasibility we put out is a bankable feasibility and we won't have to ha deal with problems with the bank at a later date. So this is very much a case of being able to look at completing all of that in the first half of next year on the feasibility study 
and by the end of the year, hopefully have put in place all of the financing structures to allow us to start development into 2023. In the case of Matanga, um, this is a very robust little project. It's down by Lake Kariba. It is three mining permits, uh, two of them holding Dibwe East and Dibwe and Matanga, and then another license holding Nyame and Guabe. There is a lot of exploration upside between these licenses uh, that we still have to drill and examine, but we already have a project here with an 11 year mine life. In the case of Niger, it's over 20 year mine life before we continue to drill on that property as well. Uh, it is a bit more rugged here, uh, but we're looking at more oxidized uranium deposits here. Very simple, therefore, from a processing point of view, uh, we get away with very low strip ratio, very low acid consumption. Uh, this project is at a PEA level at the moment, mainly because it was previously taken to a PFS, both by Denison and Africa Energy. Uh, those PFSs were very, very similar, but Denison then added the Dibwe East deposit uh, as an inferred category, and it's about 50% of the total resource. So hence the reason it is done at the PEA. We've already this year started working on that property. Uh, we've drilled out about a third of Dibwe East trying to start the infill processing. We've been very satisfied with the drill results that come out while we haven't gone through into the modeling stage. Certainly by looking at it through sections, we can see there, there is an expansion potential on the resource. There's a very strong match against the, the much closer drilling at 100 by 150 with the previous drilling, which was exceedingly spread out. So we're feeling, feeling very confident of that. Next year, we'll continue the drilling on that property um, and start to get more of the metallurgical test work done so that by the end of 2022, we can go into 2023 for the engineering side of Matanga. Um, then for Leia, um, it's a in, very interesting geological property, was owned by Rockgate. In fact, in the previous cycle, this was a $300 million project on its own. Um, it is interesting in so far as it is surrounded by gold projects. Um, we have done some gold work predominantly on the Medini license, really just to kind of understand where the overall trends were going, to understand if there's an optionality to spin that Medini license out. But what we have found uh, on the other work that we did at the beginning of last year and into this year is starting to go back and look at the geophysics. Uh, what is clear from the work that was done by Rockgate uh, is they really did not know where the major fault structures were. They were trying to find them. They had very much focused on the flat lying uranium deposit itself, which is situated between the beryllium uh, in, a, in the sandstone layer and then the laterites on top. So very much targeting just that flat area. And in fact, when they had cores going through it, they did not bother assaying the cores below the uranium. So we've gone back and we've realized that certainly from a gradient IP chargeability, which is the image in the top right, we can see that there is a lot more potential for uranium as flat lying zones. But more interestingly, when we look at the IP itself, we are picking up these very large IP targets actually underneath the mineralization. Why is this in interesting? Because at the end of the day, the copper, the silver, the gold, and the uranium have come up through these structures and then come into the sandstone layer. So clearly, unless everything is emptied out of the chargeability, there is a lot of potential for these chargeability anomalies on these faults to con still contain mineralization. And in the case of the one we've defined uh, under Falea at the moment, it's well over two kilometers in length. And we've already found another one down at Bala, and we haven't even covered the whole of the property on IP survey. So a lot of potential here. Uh, next year, we are going to look to put some holes down into this IP target to try and better understand it. You know, maybe by just continuing to explore for flat lying uranium deposits, we're actually exploring for long, wrong type of uranium deposit and that they may actually just be down in these big chargeability anomalies. And that's kind of what you see in the Athabascas where people are looking for the unconformity. And now we're starting to see people drill through it deeper down to find where their uranium deposits are. As I said at the beginning, uh, we have really changed up our board a bit as well this year. We've really focused on development side. Uh, Salma joined us, her background as an investment banker. More importantly, she was on, at SOCGEN back in 2007. 
and was part of the team that did the debt financing for Paladin's two projects. Uh, she now runs a number of businesses in West Africa, and her, in combination with Benoit LaSalle, give us an incredible amount of contact into West Africa um, and uh, relationships into that area. Eric Kraft joined us as well, um, very much a financier, uh, very wealthy in his own right, uh, and very much invested into Goviex and the resource industry. Um, we are well cashed up at the moment. Um, we're sitting marginally just below what you got on here. We've had a lot of warrants converted uh, as well recently. Um, we do have a debt on the balance sheet uh, that is currently to the Nigerian government and is due um, next year in July. Excuse me. Um, we are currently in negotiation with the government, though, to see if we can do something about deferring that uh further than as and they agreed to that previously so we'll see what we can do now so but in a very good position uh to go in to do things for next year but from a value point of view um i'd re reiterate really you know when you look at previous cycles the money's made as you've seen with paladin for going from being a developer to being a producer that's what you're betting on or you're betting on the takeouts and and the majority of the takeouts in the last cycle were african takeouts uh, as major uranium utilities and uh, producers wanted to control full uranium production from their projects. So we're obviously sitting there between the two. Our strategy very much to be a developer, but it's the same strategy that gets you the value by getting taken out. And in fact, all three of those projects in Africa that were taken out last time around were on the path to become developers in their own right. So where does that leave us? We're very positive about where the market is. We've continued to ratchet up our development as we feel more confident, and I'm sure we'll can deal with some more questions on the market as we go forward. We have structured our company more as we go forward as well, putting our team together more development focus as we move away from the exploration. We are Africa focused. We like Africa. We can get things done in Africa. Um, we've been there for a long time and, and know it well. We've got a very large mineral resource. We've got a lot of exploration upside, but our benefit is these permits. And we're already well advanced towards getting our projects up and running. And we're already put together the team, including the financing side, to get that done. And hopefully next year, if this market continues. And I think the one point that we didn't make earlier on, both David and myself, is the term price is already responding as well. So as term price has gone up to $45, you've already seen these RFPs coming out. So we've seen the utility starting to move from a fixation on spot price. They're realizing that long term needs to be dealt with. And so you're starting to see the beginning of that change by the utilities more towards the term price. It's early days. It's driven as much by the fundamentals of the market as it is by the actions of Sprott Uranium. So I'd like to thank you very much for patiently listening to me and uh, open it up to questions. Great, thank you very much, Daniel. Great presentation. We're now going to kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar, so please enter your questions into the chat box and we will get to as many as we can. So, uh, Daniel, your Meduela PFS earlier this year reduced your initial cash costs to uh, under 19 bucks a pound. Can you discuss some of the cost savings that you were able to work into the project at the time? Uh, yeah, there are a whole range of them. Um, one of them was actually just cutting our stripping ratio down, uh, very useful on that side. We brought our acid consumption down, uh, we brought our power down, um, and we reduced our water consumption as well, which reduced our capital. So there was a whole range of different things that were associated that. And the same applies now. So as we're kind of looking at where we go forward, you know, we're looking at our comminution approach. Can we reduce our power on that comminution approach considerably? Can we reduce um as well water even further uh they were going so we're continuing to look at ways of it, improving it uh one of the things i realized as well going to uh, sommelier we're so used to mining engineers to keep putting ramps in as you develop that's not how sommelier does it they put one ramp in at one end and one ramp out at the other that saves you a lot of stripping ratio um and a lot of upfront tonnage so those are the kind of things we're continuing to look at you know and the other thing i i would mention about that pfs david is we actually loaded a lot of stuff in as well. So, for example, we went out and got a full quotation for transporting uranium from Arlet 
to Com um, to Convidine and to Comorex. Um, so there aren't many people who actually have done that in their projects. We actually went and got shipping quotes to do it all the way through. We even got to the point of figuring out how much it was going to cost us to feed our labor force while they were on site. So we, we loaded in a lot of costs that we hadn't had in the previous PFS as well. When when you go and start selling this product, and we'll get to more of that later, I think, um, you know, do you plan to sell it at the gate or do you plan to have it delivered to the converter? And then uh, all utilities, all utilities want it delivered. Um, they won't take control because effectively you're trading through the book at Convidine and Comorex and Cameco. So that's the point that if you cease to own it, uh, you put it onto your book and then you book, do a book transfer to the utility who wants to buy it. So all utilities out there will want it delivered. Uh, so a key part of the test work at the moment is to make sure the products we have actually are compliant with Convidine and Comorex rules on going and feeding in. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And I wouldn't expect many problems coming out of Niger, considering it's been, what, the fourth largest uranium producer for, for quite a while, for decades here. No, I mean, there's, a, there's an absolute well-trodden path to get uranium out from Arlet all the way down to the ports and out again. Uh, I mean, obviously, at the moment, there are shipping issues, but that's now, and I would expect the shipping issues will be well, well resolved by the time we get around to, to building our projects and shipping uranium. Sure, sure. Okay. Now you are working on the feasibility study right now. You did mention water and power. Are there any other uh, sort of economic or technical improvements that you're expecting with that uh, with that feasibility study, or uh, is is most of it baked into the pre fees? Yeah, m most of it's baked in. I mean, a lot that you've got to look for the big things, and I say the power power is one, water is the other, and the other one is the stripping ratio. Uh, I mean, initial numbers, you know, I, I'm trying to kind of, I think when we started last time, we were looking at stripping out like 17 million tons. I'm trying to get that down to like 14 million tons. I mean, these are kind of off the top cuff thing. So, uh, but, you know, that makes a big difference. You know, if you're paying two to, two to $3 a pound of uranium, that's a reasonable amount of upfront. And I think we can bring in the strip ratio by, as I say, taking those ramps out. So there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, we also have to recognize all the time that we're trying to fight against inflation um, mm. as a factor around as well. So you've always got to be looking at ways improving the project uh, across the board. How about uh, molybdenum? I believe that's a byproduct as well that hasn't necessarily been worked into your costs. Uh, as of uh, no, it's in the costs and it's into the into yeah. the revenue at the moment. It, it's, it's in there. Uh, we ran it with and without. Um, the reason for that is that we only had a certain amount of data. We weren't able to put a full resource together. So the drilling that we've done at Matterwell recently uh, has been on firming up that molybdenum resource to make sure it could be okay. included. We also did some, not just on the Miriam, we actually did some drilling on M&M &M as well to make sure it was coming. I mean, I very much want it to be part of the financing structure. It's a product we can stream, for example. Um, very easy to stream off Molly, uh, less easy to stream off uranium. Sure. Okay. And you also mentioned that you rejigged the fee, uh, the pre-feasibility study to cover potential debt. Have you started looking at uh, full project financing right now? And, and how much debt are you considering? Well, as I say, when we looked at it from a debt model, uh, and the reason they did, there's no, the, the key factor as well is when we, we slowed it down for the open pit. So the open pit originally was like four years of my life. Uh, and then he went underground. And we said, well, that's actually not financeable because the debt market wants the debt tenure and then it wants a resource tail on the back of it before you go into the underground. So we have to slow everything down to make sure that fitted because there's no point in doing the whole project and then handing it to the debt market and they go, well, actually, I'm not financing that. Uh, go and do it again. Um, and so certainly on a debt coverage ratio of two times, we were looking at at least $180 million, which is about half going forward. Uh, as I said, we brought the Endeavor guys on. They did a lot of uh, due diligence before they agreed to sign up. Um, and so, you know, we are already kind of reaching out uh, to the debt market. Obviously, we really can't get into any debt until we have the final feasibility study. But you can at least sort of find out who's who in the zoo, who's interested in the region, uh, who's interested in the commodities. As you probably know, you know, debt providers change all the time. The, the fads go in and out, uh, particularly for mining debt financing. 
Okay. Uh, Arano, you know, they, uh, they, they've just shut down one of their operations there. Do you believe that they're going to be interested in picking up any uh, projects in Niger to keep its processing plant running at uh, full steam? You know, is, are there any synergies with your project? Could, are you considering toll milling at all? Well, Comanac is actually being stripped down. Uh, the board of Comanac decided that it did not want to keep the plant going and decided to close it down. Okay. Um, so there is no optionality for anyone in Niger to put anything through Common Act because it doesn't exist okay. anymore. Um, so Somayer is still available. Uh, there is options on Somayer. Uh, the issue for us is um, the molybdenum. Uh, our molybdenum grade is much higher than their molybdenum grade, and they have no molybdenum processing. So the risk for them is if we put our material in there, that they would end up with molybdenum in the uranium concentrate, which they then couldn't sell. Um, so we would have to deal with that. I mean, do we talk to them? Absolutely. Um, we'd have to find a, a route that allowed us to take our material through their plant. Okay. No, sounds good. Sounds good. So have you done maybe a trade-off study on how much that might cost to upgrade their plant? Uh, or, or do you think go with loan is your best rate, best your best uh, route forward? Yeah, we end up grinding more than they do as well. So we go to a smaller size. So there'd have to be a lot of changes at, at Somaya to be able to put our material through it. Okay, fair enough. Now you mentioned uh, long-term cost or long-term pricing up to about forty-five bucks uh, recently. Here now you you brought a uranium marketing expert in house recently. Are you looking at arranging contracts in the short term, essentially uh, off takes for future production? Well, abs absolutely. I mean, we've already bid on two RFPs. Uh, we're competing against the producers at the moment. It's a little hard to get those through. But, we, you know, we're already starting that process. We would like to do begin it later once we've got the FS out of the way, because then you have a very clear position of what you can go to, particularly on a floor price, if you're trying to structure something with a floor and a ceiling out there. Um, but, you know, I'm going to the NEI conference um, coming up in November, very much to sit down with all the utilities again. Uh, they recognize that even with all the restarts, there just isn't enough production. They need new production. Uh, the U.S. utilities particularly are, are getting a little frustrated with only having two major suppliers and they want diversity out there as well. And they recognize they need diversity. You know, and, and even with as Atom Prom, and you look at the forecast out there for the WNA, et cetera, you know, it around 2030, their Kaz Atomprom's existing operations start to fade away. They've got to bring in new production as well and need higher prices. So this is very much the trend. And so therefore the utilities are starting to worry about where they get their material from in the long term. And so, you know, that's where people like Govix. Uh, I'm able to have that conversation. So we'll look, we're not fighting for now, but we're 2025 onwards, which has just happened to be when all your contracts have run out. So, you know, how about having a conversation? So I have to say, you know, every time we reached out to one, within a week, we've been on a conference call going through it. And the same again, the same again for the NEI meetings, very quick response back. Okay. And your point to Kaz Adam Prom, I would argue that the, the next 10 years of ramp up is not going to be as easy as the first 10 or 12 years of, of ramp up as well. You know, things are getting deeper. They're uh, more, uh, more carbonate, finer grain. There's fractures and faulting, which is not what you want in ISR deposits. So I think the, the low hanging fruit has been picked. I think the, uh, oh, absolutely. for the ramp up in, in Kazakhstan is going to be more challenging. So uh, totally agree with you. Totally agree with okay. you. Uh, Matanga, you know, you mentioned that this project in Zambia is about two years behind Midwela. Do you want to complete any additional drilling here at this point, or is it really all about moving forward? Uh, you know, no. you have a PDA, move it forward. Uh, it, it, it needs the infill drilling. Um, do we want to do any more exploration? We're doing a little bit here and there. Uh, one of the things that showed around the infill drilling we've just done is the potential to actually pull the deposit out wider on strike. So we're going to see if that would work um, as well. Do we want to do a lot of exploration outside of that at the moment? No, there's no reason to. When you've got an 11-year mine life already, there's not a lot of reason to do that. So let's get the project going as it is. So um, we're currently just going through the plans for next year on how much drilling we do need to do there. Um, including some core drilling. Um, I think one of the areas that we could see some uplift as well is the disequilibrium. We have a very low disequilibrium factor there at 0.64. Uh, 
Uh, that's probably one of the lowest in the industry. So, you know, that that was all based on Matanga uh, rather than Dibwe. So there is some upside potential on some of these other sort of more esoteric issues that need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Okay. When when might you update your PEA or do you have any PFS? Oh, um, yeah, that one, we were going to just take it straight through to um, an FS. Um, so that would not get done until we probably put a new resource statement out once we got the drilling done um, for Dibwe East. Um, but we will be looking at sort of end of 2023 to have the whole thing finished. Okay. So maybe a resource estimate next year? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, yeah. And do you believe the license issues are behind you there at Matanga? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it. it it took a long time, mainly because we couldn't get the mines minister to be in his office. Uh, I mean, even after he agreed to give it back, it took us four months to get his bit of his uh, his John Hancock onto a piece of paper. So, you know, it took a while. Uh, I, and I certainly think, you know, with the new president coming in as well, one, he actually comes from southern province, which happens to be where we are. Uh, and two, he's making it very clear that this is a country that needs its mining industry and has to develop its mining industry. And I think you're going to see some, uh, they're already alluding to some positive and constructive commentary on taxation regarding the mining industry. And I certainly think I would expect to see the double taxation factor on royalty getting taken away again, because it's not adding any value to anybody. So expect to see that as a positive statement. Um, that would be good for us because... Actually, when we did the PEA for Matanga, we used a 9% royalty and it actually dropped to a 5% royalty um, in the last set of rules. So and with the double tax, it kind of evened out. Um, but if you get rid of the double tax, it's a better project. Right. Will Zambia be a joint venture partner of yours once that gets into production? Well, we had 100% of it. Yeah, so, but in, in, in a lot of uh, West African countries, for example, they, uh, the government's oh, taking, the government, no, uh, the government has no uh, rights or obligations to come in as an owner in the property at all. Uh, I mean, I think the one thing about Zambia that I'd point out is one of the 14 countries in, in Africa who have a very strong mandate to go nuclear. Um, mm -hmm. They're actually going through their radiation licensing and laws at the moment because they're working with Ross Atom uh, to actually go and become a nuclear nation. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the most exciting areas of SMRs is actually for Africa. I mean, even uh, Ghana's looking to go uh, SMR that recently they announced. So there's a lot of them who just realized that the, you know, the little SMR is perfect for the Africa scenario uh, and are pushing down that route. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on to uh, Falea, you know, would would you be interested in divesting your gold assets or and concentrate only on uranium, or is that uh, you know a, a combined project for now? Um, the Medini license we don't need. Uh, if you just look at it from that point of view, um, what I will say is that when we've had previous conversations with people they realize that the Sibaya gold trend goes straight underneath Falea. And, and actually from the IP work we'd be doing and some of the geophys, you can see that structure comes through. So everybody wants everything. Um, and so for us, we want to go and look and see what's in that IP um, chargeability, uh, David, because, it, you know, it, as you can see from the imagery, that is the feeder for the sandstone, flat-lying sandstone. We don't know what's down there. I mean, it could actually be a higher-grade uranium deposit than the one we've got already. Um, you know, we don't know um, is the answer to that. And so, hence the reason we've got to go and put some holes down into that before we can come up with any, you know, coherent strategy on it. Uh, I mean, it would worse to give it away and then certainly realize somebody's just found Olympic Dam hiding underneath our deposit. Um, you know, it, it's got, I, if, if actually wanted to look at another example of a, copper uranium gold silver project the only other one out there is olympic dam it's a dam site bigger and i'm not expecting it to be that big but you know there is that's a two kilometer long um structure sitting there that could be quite an interesting little target yeah so you you really think that the the uranium potential especially any potential high grade uranium is along the structures Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you can see that from the work that was done previously is that where we have the structures coming through feeding the material in, 
you know, this is very structurally driven. And, and that was what our problem was before is that where Rockgate had been drilling, it's very hard to see the structures and they'd used the EM, uh, but it's not the best way to find structure. So that's why we've reverted to IP uh, to find structure. And it's very clear that there are a number of kinks in the structure, and particularly where you look where the current deposit is, you actually got crossing structures, uh, which as you understand, is looking at gold companies for a long time is absolutely where you want to be. It's a bullseye. Um, so, you know, that's what needs to be looked at is where these structures are and what's driving them. Okay. And uh, what's the benefit for having the other metals associated with the uranium in this area? Um, well? the, the positive is obviously the byproduct credit. The negative is you've got to get the damn things out, um, mm. which is never the easiest process. I mean, uh, and, and therein lies the dichotomy of, of byproduct credits. If they're easy to get out, then great. One of the benefits that we have is that just as Rockgate was taken out by Denison, um, a PFS was completed. It was never issued to the market because it was never optimized, but that PFS showed a route to separate the three major products apart from each other. Um, so we know, well, I mean, from a PFS point of view, all that technical work has already been done once. Two, there is a design process that gets to the end, whether it's the right one, who knows? Uh, but it just it, we're not just an exploration play that's never done any met test work right right but that that might all change if you do find higher grade uranium along the structures and not have to worry about some of the byproduct credits or or maybe well, those grades change yeah. and the other thing it helps as well david is you've got a flat lying narrow ore body there i mean it can go to two three meters in height but if that structure changes and you've got a big bulk mining operation instead, then your mining cost drops a lot uh, at the same time. So, you know, who knows what's down there? But I think it's it's exciting uh, for us to say, hey, you know, I, and more importantly, I think you can't just keep beating your head against the same thing. If there's something else out there, let's go and figure out what it is. And then we know what to do with it. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Uh, so the gold in on the project there, are, are you interested in that at all, or moving that, that forward? Well, Medini, no. Uh, I mean, look, Medini's, you know, we're not a gold company. That's not our thing. You know, we, we it's stuck on the side. If somebody will take it off on its own by itself, then we'd happily just sell it away. Uh, we're not interested. We probably won't do any more real work on that one. Um, but as I'm saying, it's it, it ties together, as we can already see some of the, geophysics work, there is un, there is a very clear anomaly that actually feeds onto the CBI trend uh, as well, which has never been drilled. Um, so, you know, who knows how this whole thing fits together. Um, but we have to start now going down that path and, and treat it like a new exploration play because nobody's ever looked at the things we're now finding. Sure. Would you consider looking at other uranium projects, either in West Africa, Central South Africa? You know, any of the other I think the answer to that is, look, you know, we're always open to a, a sensible conversation on, on other projects. Um, you then obviously have to put that into what project it is you're looking at it. Is it already built and you want to go and tack it on because you want to bring a project up the pipeline? You don't. Do we need another exploration play down at the other end of the pipeline? Probably not, given what we've got. Uh, or is there something in between? At the end of the day, that ties into who your partner is and where, you, and where your money's going to come from. You know, um, we've got three, pro two projects already in an exploration play that are going to be financed. You know, if we did, could JV them all out and reduce our capital commitment, obviously that can be done that way. But, you know, you never say no. You, you have to keep looking. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions here, if you don't mind. Um, cash position. Uh, and then what are your exploration development budgets for this year and perhaps next? Um, for this year, most of our exploration is now finished. Um, we've done all of the drilling in, in each of the ones. So it quietens down into the second part of this year, mainly feasibility study. Uh, cash at the last quarter was about $9 million. Um, We've had more warrants and options. So there's about 3 to $4 million in options and warrants in the money. Uh, that die in November, December. So expect most of that to come in as well. Um, next year, February as well, all of the assets that were secured for Linkwood become unlocked. Um, so there's $2 million sitting there that they owe us back and we have can grab the security if we need to at that point, which we can't do at the moment. Um, next year budget, I'm currently going through it, uh, but probably going to be looking at a total budget, something around, around $10, $15 million. 
Okay. Would you have to come to market if you want to do everything you want to do? Uh, it, it, it's always an option. Uh, and again, it depends on the, you know, everything that we've done in the past, David, is as things accelerate, we've gone a bit faster and used more money to get there. If the uranium market really accelerates and we decide that we've just got to not only got to get Matawela going faster, we've got to get really pushed Matanga and we've got to push Falea, then obviously we will come to and raise more money because we need it. Okay. And then what's the timing on your Medwela feasibility study? As I say, for first half of the end of before the end of the first half of next year. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, last question, and this is more of a, a broad, uh, I guess, crystal ball question here, Daniel. Uh, for the uranium price cycle, do you expect a spike and a crash, or do you expect more mature, steady increase uh, to a more balanced market over the next couple of years? Um, well, let's split the market apart first. Uh, you've got to split the spot in this contract market. Um, I think that's the first comment to make. And I think what you will, as you've seen in the past, I think the contract market is going to be slow and steady into a more sensible price range. I think that is is clear. You have a very strong duopoly over there who have an influence over the market. There are some big projects floating around um, to come in and some restarts, but you still need more. But I think ultimately price will incentivize projects. You've got projects all the way from, you know, $30, $40 up to needing $70, $80. So at some point, there is that point where you pull projects in. You know, our, our strategy has been very much focused on Cameco, Kaz, Adam Prom price range forecasting of $50 to $60 and saying that's where you got to go. Um, I certainly think you're now starting to see the analysts push up and, there and higher. Um the spot price, on the other hand, yeah, I think that's very, very likely we'll see a spike in that one. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't see why not. I think it, as more and more material gets fed into the contract market anyway, uh, the carry trade stuff is disappearing as well. So it, it does become very much, I need material. Where the hell am I going to find it? Um, mm. it? Inventories are declining. Therefore, there's less to find from somewhere else uh, in somebody's back door. Uh, so, yeah, expect some price spike. Um, but the key number out there is that term contract. And, you know, that's the reality that everybody is push pushing towards, which is this industry needs sensible long term pricing, not just for the uranium miners, but utilities need it to be able to compete in the long term energy market uh, going forward. So, yeah, expect a solid, st stable market going forward for that. Right. And not to put you on the spot here, but if if uh, if term prices were 45 bucks, would that be something that uh, would enable sustainable production at Meduela? Uh We used fifty five dollars in the PFS. So, you know, forty five is is too low for us um, at this time. If I can get it down lower in the PFS, then, yeah, we, we've got to have a crack at it. But yeah, I mean, you've got to recognize where your project is. But, you know, the reality is that forty five dollars, there's not enough projects come on stream to fill the market um you need uh, well over 50 dollars, well over 60 dollars to really bring enough you know you look at the restarts out there david you know the african restarts to start with i mean they were all that most of them have got 35 dollar plus cash costs on top of the capital investment they've still got to put in you know expect them to need 60 to 70 dollars if you look at the north american projects as well well um, a lot of those closed at 50 dollar uranium on the way down so you're going to need well over fifty dollars for them to restart. There aren't many projects that can really get going at forty-five dollars um, to fifty dollars. Right, right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, great insight. Uh, appreciate you joining us today. Oh, absolute pleasure, and, and thank you for having on and some some very interesting questions from yourself and the audience. Much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for everybody else uh, tuning in. Uh, Red Cloud Securities will be back tomorrow afternoon when Taylor sits down with BlackRock Silver. So that's October 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And reminder that our October Vest Conference is October 18th, 19th, and 20th. And you may sign up at redcloudfs.com. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.